Um, I'm Laura Fleming. I'm a physician and epidemiologist. I work at the University of Exeter in the Center for Environment and Human Health. And I have the pleasure and honor of running a panel called Water, Ocean, and Human Health, Blue Planet Health. And we were originally on the first afternoon, but I think this is a great position to be in because we're actually helping you to wrap up the most important place in the world. Okay, I'm going to briefly describe some issues around water and human health, and before I do that, because I realize that people are still coming back from their wonderful break, I just wanted to list a couple of fun facts about water and sanitation, and um, by the way, that tracks to SDG 6. So, as you all know, very little of the water available is drinkable. Most people in the world, or a huge number of people, have problems getting water. In particular, women spend a lot of time going for water every day. And this, unfortunately, the situation will get worse unless we, that's all of us in this audience and beyond, do something about it. And just so to make it all come home, us and all living creatures, uh, or at least biological creatures, are made of water. When I think about fun facts around oceans, and again, that tracks to SDG 14 and beyond, the ocean covers most of the world, or the earth, the planet, it's most of the water, it provides a huge amount of our oxygen, and it also has been absorbing a lot of our carbon dioxide, and the result of that has been increasing ocean acidification. It drives our global weather patterns, and the majority of the world's, world's pre creatures are actually under the sea. And many of us uh, rely on the coastal areas and the oceans for our food. I would also like to just give a shout out to UNDP. They've been doing a really interesting job around oceans and um, uh, the sustainable development goals. Now, when we talk about ocean and human health, and you'll see some of that in this panel, there's a lot around risk. And there's all sorts of risks associated with um, working in oceans and human health area. There's climate change, there's extreme events, there's harmful algal blooms, there's um, the fact that our fisheries are heavily under threat, there's microbial pollution, and there's man-made chemicals, including plastics, and you'll hear some from my panelists on that. And that has been there for a long time, and it seems to be getting worse. But I think what we don't talk a lot about in Oceans and Human Health, but even larger in the umbrella of planetary health, and some of my prior colleagues have already talked about that, are the benefits to human health and well-being from interacting with oceans. A clear benefit, although it has risks and benefits, is seafood. We also know a lot about forecasting events thanks to interactions and science around oceans. We gain a lot of um, natural products from oceans, and we have used uh, marine models as models of human disease, particularly with the move away from uh, mam mammalian uh, laboratory animals. And there's a whole area of health and well-being that is growing. A lot of my colleagues in this uh, conference have been talking about how green spaces are good for you. There's a whole nother area around blue spaces, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that some my colleagues and I have been doing in that area. And I'll also point to the EU growth strategy, which mentions additional opportunities around blue energy, aquaculture, marine minerals, marine tour tourism, and marine biotechnology. I will note that that um, whole push does emphasize environmental sustainability, though it doesn't really say what that means, but it really doesn't say anything about health and well-being, except that people will have lots of jobs. So now I'm going to briefly talk about um, what we call blue health, and this is work of my colleagues at the European Center, but other people, including those in the audience. And if you try to think of a model of how do we get from interacting with um, blue environments to health and well-being, possible mechanisms might be that there's decreased stress, increased exercise, you socialize with your family or not more, or it's just something in the environment. And this is a study that we did a while ago, but I like it because it's, uh, it's very simple. I'm offering you all a hotel room. It's the same hotel room. How many people want view A? Raise your hands. How many people want view B? There you go. And how many people want view C? Okay. So, <laughs> I won't even, that's a whole other study sitting over there. Um, even in Uzbekistan, which is completely landlocked, they want B. 
And at least in 2010, people in the UK were willing to pay more money for this view. So to me, there's something very visceral here. We've also used census data in the UK to look at self-reported health. That's a very um, useful variable that you can use across different cultures. It's more predictive of your health than your GP. And if you look at taking into account things like income, people report better self-reported health next to green spaces, but also next to coasts and other blue spaces. And as a public health person, what's really important to me is that actually the people who report the highest effects are the people who are poor in the UK. And this effect, by the way, lasts if you, it, it has different, um, it continues even if you move. We've also used other data, and we're trying to use lots of different type of data, as people have been talking about, to make the case or not for health and well-being from blue environments. And we've looked at what do people do in the UK in these different environments. And what we found is that when people are in blue environments, they exercise more, they exercise for longer, and they burn up more energy. So there's the potential for it being good for your health, your physical health, as well as your mental health. And then we've also worked with a lot of local businesses who use the natural environment as an intervention. So this particular one was with troubled youth. They spent a week learning how to surf in Cornwall. And we measured their blood pressure and some of the other physiologic measures, but also just how they were feeling about themselves and their family before and after this intervention. Very small study, but again, saw a positive effect. And then we've done a number of laboratory studies where we stress people, and this is more psychology studies, so they tend to do things like put your hand in cold water or make you take a math test. Um, and then they uh, measure your mood, and then they expose you to blue and green things, and then they measure it again. And we've used things like film, and we're starting to use VR. And we've also worked with the National Marine Aquarium. And this is a study we just finished fairly recently with Plymouth um, University. To, we randomized people who came into the dental office. They got either normal standard of care, a virtual city, or an interactive, beautiful blue environment called Wemberley. And when you measure their, the, how much they experience pain, it was much better if they had the blue VR environment. And this was true even several weeks later, and they also reported they're more likely to sign up for the next dental visit, which from a public health point of view is very important. And this is even with removing teeth. They did get anesthetic as well. So when I go back to this model, my feeling is it's complicated, like everything else we've heard about at this, at this conference. And the other thing I think that complicates it is, how are we gonna take this whole thing of health and well-being from the natural environment and operationalize it in ways that are good not only for humans, but also for the environment? I'm worried that we will love our natural environments to death. We have another um, study called Blue Health. It's across Europe, paired for by the Horizons 2020. And in that, what we're trying to do is figure out how we can use blue infrastructure across environment, climate, and health sectors to actually get co-benefits. So a fountain could be a place that's good for your health and well-being, but it also could mitigate climate change. And we also are doing a large survey across different countries. It includes not only European countries, but also Australia, Canada, California, and Hong Kong. And it will look at what people do and think about in blue environments. But an even bigger challenge to me is what do we do in the, what's been called to, in this conference, the Global South. I've had colleagues who came out to me in, from Africa and said the most dangerous and unhealthy places in their countries are along the coast. And this is a, a, another project we're involved in led by Plymouth Marine Lab. Um, uh, Blue Ventures, who's in the audience, is also involved in this. And what we're trying to do is to work with four different countries and UNESCO biospheres or marine protected areas and see if we can look at how the people who live near or in these biospheres, how their health and well-being can be improved with marine planning and also around issues of food security. But I think that's the real challenge. And I just wanna thank many colleagues at my center, but also other colleagues beyond. So the last challenge I see, I think it's a challenge not just for oceans and human health, but for planetary health. There's been a lot of work around global ocean literacy. The idea is that we are one big ocean. We share an ocean. Um, and a lot of literacy work around what are the problems that we need to think about and what are the positives that we get from it. And I think that kind of work needs to be done for planetary health. It's a brand new group and they need to do that kind of work. But I think even more what we have to deal with is the issue of almost apathy. 
and I don't know if I can read this, but it says, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, I just don't. And I think that's true in general. We face, we have to engage people who currently may or may not care about both oceans and the planet. And so as another earlier speaker said, I think we need a David Attenborough for, planet ocean, or for the uh, planetary health. And I'll just end, and I did, for the record, put this slide in before the wonderful talk yesterday, but I love this statement. If the land is well and the sea is well, the people um, will thrive. And again, my thanks to the Maori people, who are clearly way ahead of their time. Um, okay, that's my talk <laughs> to set the stage. Thank you. Thank you. And we have four terrific, very short, they know that, short, uh, talks, and I'm going to introduce them now and they'll just come up and give their talks. Um, so the first talk is, um, is by Jessa Gebhardt. Gep She's a postdoctoral fellow in environmental sciences at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center, um, which is in Maryland. And she'll be talking about fisheries and food security. We then have a talk by Dr. Mabubar Rahman, who's based in Bangladesh at ICDDRB. He is a physician and runs studies around um, maternal and child health, food security, and other issues. Um, we then have a talk by Priyanka Jamwal, who is an environmental engineer who works with social scientists at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology in India. And she will be talking about a water quality management case study and last but not least, we have Maria Westerbos, who is the founder and director of Plastic Soup Foundation, a science journalist by, by history, and she'll be talking about ocean plastics. And she's from the Netherlands. So all of the speakers are gonna come up, do their thing, and then we hopefully will have about 30 minutes for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, I'm going to be speaking today on behalf of a much larger group about future scenarios for the role of fisheries and food security under climate change. The first point I'd like to make today is that seafood plays a really important role in food security, both directly and indirectly. The direct benefits from seafood stem primarily from the consumption of seafood and its contribution to nutrition, while the indirect benefits stem from the livelihoods that are derived from fisheries, as well as the broader economic growth. Globally, around 10 to 12 percent of the world's population depends on fisheries and aquaculture for livelihood. This ranges from the production of fisheries in aquaculture and also capture fisheries, as well as the processing and trade of those seafood products. Um, this is highly concentrated in Asia, as you can see here in this map, uh, followed by Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. Of those 12%, over 90% of these people engaged in fisheries are engaged in small-scale fisheries, with about half of those being women. This is important because in the small-scale fisheries, the seafood not only contributes as an important source of income and livelihood diversification, but also as an important source of food. It's estimated that more than 90% of seafood produced through small-scale fisheries is destined for local human consumption. At the global level, seafood provides nearly 20% of animal protein and is a really important source of micronutrients and essential fatty acids. The supply or apparent consumption of seafood around the world varies greatly with the highest levels of consumption of 50 or more in a lot of island nation, parts of East and Southeast Asia, and some areas of coastal Africa. Um, at the more local level though, these values can vary due to a variety of economic, ecological, policy, and social factors. And these can contribute to uncertainty in the future role of seafood and food security. One of the biggest factors expected to influence the role of seafood in food security is climate change. So as we've seen with a lot of terrestrial animals, seafood is also moving poleward. Uh, this work by William Chung shows a map of projected change in seafood um, or marine catch potential, you see the largest decreases there in red and orange, and these are predominantly around the equator. Now you may notice some of these areas with largest, the largest catch are also the areas where we saw some of the highest consumption of seafood. 
to dig into this a little bit more, um, product of, an early product of a welcome-funded project led by Chris Golden looked at these hotspots where there was high nutrition dependency on seafood, shown here in these regions in orange and yellow, and where those co-occurred with some of these largest decreases in seafood catch potential under climate change. What they found in the study was that more than 10% of people could face nutrition deficiencies in the coming decades due to climate change and fisheries. But there are a lot of other drivers that can influence the role of seafood in food security, including population growth and whether seafood production can keep up with that population growth, the question of migration, so people moving between regions or moving from rural areas where they may have more direct access to seafood into urban areas where it's more available in the markets. There's a question of economic growth, which can determine how much seafood might be imported, as well as some of the demand for that seafood. And that plays into dietary change. We know with with rising incomes, there tends to be an increased demand in, uh, for animal protein. And we also see other kinds of changes, like the adoption of Western diets and increased consumption of processed and easily accessible foods. Policy can, of course, play a role in the future um, related to some of the management policies for our fisheries, as well as broader food policies and trade policies. And then finally, there's the question of aquaculture growth and other kinds of technological change within the fisheries sector. Already, aquaculture comprises half of the seafood that's consumed globally and is likely to continue to play an important role. All of these creates a lot of uncertainty, though, uh, with many variables that range from social to ecological. And th this uncertainty can be explored using uh, scenario analysis. And so that's the approach that we take here, is use a variety of different kinds of scenarios and bring together multiple stakeholders in order to explore some of these plausible futures and bound what these likely scenarios might be. The model we use moves from environmental change in the marine environment to the impacts on catch and translates that into changes in consumption and then looks ultimately at the outcomes for nutrition and health. Within this model, we engage a range of disciplines as well as bring in some of the uh, practitioners and, and experts in particular country regions and regions in order to look at which scenarios might actually be most reasonable. Within the ecological portion of the model, we build on William Chung's and use an adapted version of William Chung's model of climate change in fisheries that also incorporates some of the changes in catch effort. This is, allows us to look at scenarios of changes in management, as well as different climate change scenarios. As an example, here are some of the results from the Philippines looking at uh, some of these catch scenarios going into the future under different cases of uh, catch reduction. And so you can see here, there's in the sort of medium term, you see optimal catch under a 40% catch after effort reduction scenario. When you look out even further, though, you can see that it's really the 70% reduction that gives you these optimal uh, outcomes in the very long term. And this is an important point to think about since these kinds of time frames don't often um, match the time frames that politicians are often, uh, often operating on. When we flip to Bangladesh and look at the climate change impacts on different sectors. You can see that in the artisanal sector, that's where we see the largest decreases in catch. In this case, you see even more dramatic decreases in the higher climate change scenario, which is the thicker line there. And when you take these together, we see that there's an overall decrease in catch in Bangladesh out to 2050. These decreases in catch can then be converted into changes in consumption using an economic model. In this case, we use an adapted version of the Asia fish model, which is a partial equilibrium model, to be able to look at different scenarios of dietary change uh, income growth, and aquaculture growth. When we look at the results for Bangladesh, those decreases in catch don't, um, don't show up here in the consumption. We actually see an increase in seafood consumption overall. And this is because it's largely made up through aquaculture. So this is a low and high aquaculture productivity case for urban and rural areas. One thing that's noticeable here, though, is that in the low aquaculture productivity case of about 1% growth per year, it's really stagnated. And so what that suggests is that we need at least 1% growth in order to maintain essentially current levels of seafood consumption. These changes in consumption can then be converted into nutrition 
intakes and ultimately health outcomes by taking the species-specific nutrient profiles from the genus database and converting those changes in consumption into nutrition. Here are just a couple examples for protein, iron, and zinc. And you'll notice these really look similar to the changes in consumption that we just saw. Uh, we can also look at a lot of other, I think 20 other micronutrients and look at the different patterns to see uh, changes across those and think about different targets. In order to flip though, among these many different scenarios that we have, we are working with a visualization expert at the University of Maryland to develop an interactive management tool. This allows different kinds of stakeholders and researchers to, to come together and explore these very different scenarios that uh, can have different outcomes on nutrition and work their way through some of the ecological scenarios all the way to these nutrition outcomes. So they can flip among the protein or zinc or whatever nutrient is of most interest to them and back out which of the possible scenarios or combinations of futures might allow them to get to those nutrient outcomes. And so to close, I'd like to emphasize that seafood plays a really important role in global food security, but that future role of seafood and food security depends on this range of ecological, policy, social, and economic factors. One way that we can deal, though, with these multiple sources of uncertainty, rather than trying to project one ultimate outcome, is to look at these range of outcomes and try to bound them and think about which are the actual targets we want to get to and how we might get there. These kinds of scenarios allow us to bring together multiple disciplines and stakeholders to the same table and begin that dialogue. So we think this can be a really productive way to start envisioning and thinking about how changes in the environment can ultimately translate into changes in nutrition. Thank you. My lovely and great moderator was kind enough to bring sea salt for us. Few minutes back, she gave us. So I will little bit touch on the salt issues today. About 50 million people living in the 734 kilometer coastal line of Bangladesh. and nearly one-third of the total population of Bangladesh and a population greater than many countries. All of them are exposed to ground saline water. So to mitigate this, government and the development partners are promoting rainwater harvesting. The objective of this presentation today to compare the effect of mineral intake and blood pressure between groundwater and rainwater drinkers. Sea water intrusion affected many coastal communities that depends on groundwater for drinking purposes. In particular, coastal areas of large deltas in South Asia and Southeast Asia are particularly vulnerable. In this graph, you can see that uh, the drinking water vulnerable areas are River Ganges in Bangladesh, Mekong Delta, and Red River Delta in Vietnam. Drinking saline water has been associated with high sodium intake and high blood pressure of the population. Observational studies from southwest coastal Bangladesh found saline water was associated with high blood pressure among adult population, pregnant women, and high incidence of preeclampsia. 
Ecological studies from the Mekong Delta found high admission of hospital due to the hypertension. What does salinity mean? Generally, we think salinity means high sodium. But salinity refers to all ion dissolved in the water. The unit of measuring salinity is electrical conductivity, which means how easily electron can pass a certain distance of water. Ions are conductors, more ion means high electrical conductivity. The cations are sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and the anions are chloride, bicarbonate, and sulfate. The interventions people are using, rainwater harvesting and pond sand filters generally used in the low income settings, whereas desalination used in the high income settings. Again, the objective is to compare the mineral concentration, mineral intake, and blood pressure among the groundwater and rainwater drinkers. We use this data from a stepwise randomized control trial published in the BMG Open. We implemented the study stepwise randomized control trial in 16 communities of southeast coastal Bangladesh. Each community was considered as a cluster. Stepwise means following baseline or step one, four communities were randomized to have access of interventions. We conducted the study during the dry season in December 2016 to April 2017, and each steps corresponded in progression of dry season. We enrolled around 1,200 participants from 543 households. During baseline, we collected socioeconomic status, highest, and cardiovascular disease risk factors. We in all visit, we collected exposures and outcome data. Exposure data was household reported primary source of drinking and cooking water, and the, uh, also measured the electrical conductivity of the uh, both drinking and cooking waters. As outcome measure, we measured the blood pressures in all visits. We also collected 24 hours urine samples uh, in all visit to measure the uh, electrolyte concentration in urine. We used multi-level linear models to analyze the effect of groundwater and rainwater on blood pressure and urinary mineral concentration. In all models, we used three-level random intercepts to account for multi-level clustering of longitudinal visits within person, person within households, household within community. Robust standard error are estimated and adjusted for the potential confounders. In the box plot showing the salinity level of rainwater and groundwater at each of the five visits, we used electrical conductivity as a measure of salinity and the groundwater salinity levels were consistently higher in comparison to the rainwater. Compared to the groundwater drinkers, rainwater drinkers had lower urinary sodium, but also lower urinary potassium, calcium, and magnesium. We had seen rainwater had low electrical conductivity 
compared to the groundwater in all visits. Low urinary excretion of sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium among the rainwater drinkers are due to low mineral contents in rainwater. Adjusted model demonstrates statistical significant reduction of urinary minerals, statistically significantly higher blood pressure among rainwater drinkers compared to the groundwater drinkers. In this slide, we show that the association between urinary mineral systolic blood pressure association. Higher sodium intake was associated with high blood pressure. And potassium, magnesium, calcium are associated with low blood pressure. This slide explains why rainwater drinkers had high blood pressure because they had low intake of minerals. What are the implications from these findings? Considerable effort has been made to encourage communities to harvest rainwater during rainy season as a source of fresh drinking water. Drinking rainwater may put community at cardiovascular risk by reducing intake of calcium and magnesium. Promoting rainwater as a low saline source should include methods to remineralize with calcium and magnesium to minimize cardiovascular risk. Rainwater harvesting policy should be revisited. I acknowledge the contribution of all of my colleagues, collaborators, as well as the study participants. And finally, I acknowledge the funder, Welcome Trust, for funding this important study. And thank you all. Um, thank, you, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for providing me this wonderful opportunity. And uh, today I'm going to talk about water quality and health risk, uh, sorry, water pollution and health risk in rapidly up urbanizing catchments in developing countries. So uh, this particular study is based in the city of Bangalore, which is also called as uh, the IT, capi IT capital of India. And, this uh, city is located in the southern part um, of, uh, of India. So quickly looking at the population growth, you can see in the last decade, our population has, uh, city's population has increased from 5.6 million to 11 million. It's almost 100% growth. Now, considering this level of population growth, there is a large gap, huge gap between the water supply and wastewater infrastructure because the, the population growth is so high that Infrastructure is unable to keep up, keep pace with the growing population. And you can see that uh, waste, there is an inadequate uh, sewage treatment capacity in, in the city. Now, coming to the numbers, if you see that uh, per day, there is around 4, 1,400 million liters of wastewater which is being generated, out of which 44% is treated, 2% is reused, and 56% is untreated, which is discharged into open storm drains. Open storm drains which are meant to carry rainwater now carry wastewater, partially treated wastewater, untreated wastewater, and this is the current state of urban rivers in any developing, uh, in any growing cities of, uh, of developing countries. And this is what we will see. It's a common sight in any of the city uh, uh, across, uh, across developing world. Now, this, I say that this is wastewater, but again, this way water doesn't go waste. There are downstream uh, peri-urban population which use this water for, for, uh, for irrigation and for uh, livestock, for rearing livestock. So, and again, this problem is not unique uh, to Bangalore. It spreads across, it expands across other cities like Pune, Delhi. Every city experiences this kind of, these kind of issues. So, 
Taking a case study of Bangalore, we wanted to answer these three important questions. First, what is the extent and risk of chemical contamination? What are the sources of uh, chemical po uh, pollution? And why is pollution occurring despite of presence of regulatory bodies and laws? So this is, um, uh, uh, this is Bangalore City, and the, the, red, uh, uh, the red outlining which you see, it's a Rishabhavati catchment where my study is based. So quickly, this is the study site, and if you look, um, this uh, is an urbanized catchment, which is the upstream part from where wastewater is generated, both industrial and domestic. And this is the, these are the downstream villages, basically peri-urban population, who are using this water for irrigation as well as for rearing li uh, livestock. So to answer the first question, what is the extent and risk of chemical contamination, we took uh, three villages and, um, and again, uh, to estimate the risk, we considered all exposure pathways. We said that population is exposed to contaminants through drinking water, through vegetables, through irrigation water, and through milk. And uh, to, to, uh, to uh, estimate the risk, we collected samples from irrigation water, soil samples, groundwater, and vegetables which they grow using wastewater, and we used simple uh, dose response models to come up with health hazard index, and we found that hazard index is greater than one, which means that population is at significant risk. So then the second question, when we went with this data to a regulatory, water, uh, to a regulatory board, their answer was that it's not the big industries, but there are small industries uh, in the catchment which are causing this pollution. So we really wanted to know from where this pollution is coming. So we, we took this cap catchment, which has a lot of industries in it. We uh, mapped all the red category industries, which are toxic industries releasing effluents, um, which release toxic effluents. Uh, and we mapped them in the catchment, and we selected two locations in the catchment to find out what are the cons concentration and what are the quantity of heavy metals which are being released every day in the, uh, downstream. So we collected samples every hour for 24 hours, and we measured all water quality, physical, chemical, and biological parameters in water. And we also measured flow, because if you want to know quantity, you should know how much water volume of water is flowing out every day from the catchment. Uh, so yeah, so this is how the flow was uh, measured, and uh, and this is uh, how the data looks. So what we found was that there is very high variability in heavy metal levels in, in in the stream, and this I'm just showing. So we carried out this study for one year, but I'm just showing you data for like you know so um, two two monitoring campaigns. So you can see that there is high variability, and even just look at the sample color, you can see that there are a lot of uh, discharges which are happening. And then we estimated what is the heavy metal load which is being discharged every day from this catchment. And we estimated that there is around 4 kgs of lead um, uh, and 9 kgs of nickel, uh, 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 4 kgs of nickel, 9 kgs of chromium being discharged every day into the, catch, uh, in, into the downstream areas. Now looking at the geographical distribution, we also found that it's the upstream portion which is, causing, which is releasing a lot and a lot of heavy metals in, 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 into the catchment. Now coming to the third question, why is pollution occurring despite of presence of regulatory bodies and laws. Now, the reasons are, first of all, poor monitoring, and second, there is goal shifting, the way the institution is operating, and there are gaps in the legal framework. So coming to for, uh, first on pollution mon monitoring, right now, regulatory board officials, uh, they pick up sample during working hours from 9.30 to 5.30, during working hours, they'll pick up sample, and you'll not find any heavy metal because most of the industries discharge pollution during night. Uh, so then you, you just uh, say that there's no pollution, but the reality is that it's the population which is suffering, and there are uh, health implications of this. So really, we need to have a real-time monitoring, uh, especially of the industrialized areas. We need to have a real-time monitoring of, uh, of uh, proxy parameters, which can tell you the extent of pollution. Uh, second uh, is poor regulation and goal, sh goal shifting. We, for, so we did interviews with uh, pollution uh, uh, the officials uh, who work in Pollution Control Board office, and we found that officials, they spend 90% of their time doing paperwork. They spend 90% of time providing consent for establishment and consent for operating of these uh, effluent treatment plants rather doing actual work, going to the field, picking up sample, and sending it to the lab uh, for, uh, for analysis. And uh, the other thing we found was that 
existing irrigation water quality criteria do not have standards for heavy metals. So if you look at, so this is a central pollution control board water quality criteria if the water body is to be used for different uh, purposes. And you can see for irrigation water, it's, it's pH, conductivity, salinity, and boron content, which are the, uh, which decides whether water should be used for irrigation or not. Now the irony is that the, when, when you measure, when, so this, the red line shows uh, conductivity levels, which is the standard for irrigation water, and this is what we have found. The blue line shows the conductivity levels 24 hours, but look at the chromium levels. So it means that if you have irrigation water standard which doesn't cover heavy metals, there is still, you can't say that this water is fit for irrigation, and that is what is happening. You, uh, the, the water bodies are being labeled as Category E, farmers are using it for irrigation, but then it also has a lot of heavy metals, and there is, of course, risk to, to, to uh, farmers as well as uh, to consumers. Yeah. So the important findings of this study was that, yes, there is a significant health risk to the peri-urban population. Ex there is exposure through multiple pathways and multiple routes. Urban streams are highly polluted and illegal industrial discharges are the main sources of heavy metal pollution in urban streams. Grab samples does not reflect uh, the extent of uh, pollution and in-stream quality standards uh, must include standards for heavy metal and all other uh, chemicals that are likely to affect ecosystem health. Thank you. Hi all, thank you very much for having me here. I'm uh, Maria Westerbos, founder and director of the Plastic Soup Foundation, located in Amsterdam. Closer. <laughs> I don't have much of a voice today. I have a little bit of a flu. Um, I have a request. I need your help, but let's first look at this trailer. Do we have the courage to face the realities of our time? 
and allow ourselves to feel deeply enough that it transforms us and our future. Come with me on a journey through the eye of beauty. Across an ocean of grief. And beyond. Often this trailer about the midway, 2,000 miles offshore, nobody ever sets foot there, but Chris Jordan did for years and years. Often this trailer has the effect of a bullet that uh, hits target. The plastic soup is no longer an issue far away, but reached your heart, demanding personal involvement. The Plastic Soup Foundation is known for several campaigns, but especially for Beat a Microbeat that started in 2012 against additionally, uh, intentionally uh, added plastic beads in your toothpaste, shampoo, and other cosmetics. At this moment, we lead a consortium of 98 NGOs in 44 countries. Together, we did beat the beat within six years and our opponents, Unilever, Johnson & Johnson, L'Oreal, Procter & Gamble, all multinationals and hundreds of smaller brands faced microbeads out of their products. We also, thank you. Thank you very much. I must say we're proud of it. <laughs> and it was fun, it was fun too. We also offered the consumer an alternative, a hallmark, zero plastics inside. And until now, 55 brands signed up, under which Veleda, which is worldwide a quite famous brand. Let me be very clear. The biggest threat is, in this case, the smallest. We are talking microplastics. And that's why we, in our second campaign, declared war to synthetic microfibers. We fight, as Plastic Soup Foundation, the pollution at the source. These uh, very tiny fibers are the most invasive form of microplastics. Already in 2011, the world heard of this. Maybe a single one of you remembers Mark Anthony Brown back in 2011. And he was the first scientist to monitor coastlines from all around the world, where he found thousands and thousands of microfibers from clothes. He estimated that at least 1,900 fibers per garment were released in one wash. And he called for immediate action because his findings were very worrying, but nobody listened. Right now, we know the problem is much and much bigger than Mark Anthony thought. Mermaid's Life, financed by the European Union, was the first to use nanotechnology and the shocking result published in 2017, 9 million fibers per wash. We as Plastic Soup Foundation did the dissemination. And what we also know is this. There are worldwide 2 billion people using a wash washing machine. In 2050, this will be 5 billion people. Consider the incredible amount of microfibers that will go down the drain, entering our waterways and the ocean day after day. To inform a bigger audience, we produced this video, which will make you smile a little. Thank you. 
Sorry to interrupt you guys, but did you know that your washing machine is probably the biggest source of microplastics polluting our oceans? Come on guys, let's keep it clean. Visit lifemermaids.eu to help. The video you just saw corresponds directly with this one. It's probably the first time ever you see plankton eating your shirt or fleece. Or socks. Last week I showed this to the fashion industry in Vancouver. They were not amused. Not at all. <laughs> A study in Paris found out that it's raining fibers, almost 200 microplastics per square meter per day at least. And it explains why scientists and investigating journalists found fibers in beer, bottled water, salt and honey. When you are sailing the canals in Amsterdam, you put your beer on the edge of the boat, just wait 10 minutes, measure how many plastics are in, there are in there, and you will be shocked. We breathe in our socks, scarves, sweaters. Persistent small pieces are found in the tissues of our lungs, but there's more. Scientists think plastic is causing cancer, autoimmune diseases, autism, and so on. And that is why we, together with medical doctors from all over the world, call for action. If, plastics make, if plastic makes us sick, we must stop ASAP plastic leakage to the environment, including our own body. One of our goals, we want 90% less release of microfibers by 2050, and that's ambitious, ambitious but possible. Let me show you very quickly some options. Throughout the whole value we can do things, uh, the whole value chain. But the most promising at this moment is a washing machine filter and it took us four years to find this, to find this filter. This, it, it's from Planet Care from Slovenia and it stops more than 80% of the fibers. It's end of pipe but it's proven over 80% of the fibers will not be eaten by plankton anymore or we will not breathe it, um, uh, inhale it anymore. What started, and there it comes, what started in the 50s of the last century, have a very good look at this picture. When we thought that good things are twice as good in cellophane and we packed our babies in there, is in 2018, a very serious threat for the ocean, but also for ourselves and our unborn children. As Plastic Soup Foundation, we ring the alarm bell, asking you to help us find the scientific and medical evidence that is needed to stop this incredible tsunami of plastic and microplastics. Our new campaign is called Save the Ocean, Save Yourself. It will start next week on June 8th in New York on World Ocean Day. Thank you. You all right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, amazing range of um, ocean and water talks and some very interesting science and campaigns. 
Um, uh, because, ironically, several of our speakers are ill due to change in climate, they have asked that we answer one question at a time. Um, so if anybody is interested in, in asking questions, please go up there and I'll just go back and forth and they'll answer one at a time. Hello, Jeff. Just introduce yourself, thank you. Hello, Jeff Wyatt, uh, University of Rochester School of Medicine. Um, I'm wondering how we um, assess the risk, balance the risk and benefit of eating fish versus chemical contamination, especially mercury. Um, Jessica, do you want to start that? But I'm going to open all questions to anybody who wants to answer. Yeah, sure. So I think this is an important question that comes up a lot, and it's a little bit outside my area of expertise. I work on a big interdisciplinary team, and I mostly focus on seafood trade. So somebody else can maybe correct me. But um, my understanding is that with at least many kinds of fish, so one thing to think about with seafood is that it's an extremely diverse production system. So when we talk about beef for chicken, we're talking about something fairly specific. But when we talk about seafood, it's everything from inland production systems to coastal to marine, aquacultured and capture, and everything from mollusks to crustaceans to fin fish. So it's extremely diverse. And so you're going to have really different uh, potentials for something like a heavy metal contamination. But I think it's important to think about those and weighing those, those potential risks versus a lot of the health benefits that we've seen, including the importance of um, omega-3 fatty acids for development and brain health. And so, um, yeah, so I guess I think there are a lot of factors to consider within that. And maybe some of the other people who uh, focus on pollution have insights too. Does any of the other panelists want to add to that? Maria? Go for it. Okay. Oh, Priyanka? Okay. Um, um, uh, we know that the uh, plastics that are taken in by fish uh, uh, enter our body too. We know it uh, might pass the cell brains. It's in the fat tissue. Um, in Indonesia, they are now starting a big research project where they um, monitor thousands of families that eat fish and then see what the ad additional plastics in there do with the body. At the same time, we are, we are, f we are sure of the um, toxics, added, the, the chemical ad additives that are in plastic are very bad for our health. So whatever the fish eats, we eat, and the toxics will leak in our body. At the same time, we don't know what the little nanoplastics do with our body. Um, the scientists think that they hit our brain, my example, and that is um, the reason why we have more brain attacks. But it's not sure. That's one of the reasons I need help. Priyanka, did you want to add something? I think um, if I understood the uh, question correctly, uh, the question was that what are the benefits of... Uh, <laughs> I'm just clarifying myself. I think it was what are the benefits of, uh, of eating food which is not contaminated with heavy metals. It's, there are studies uh, which have sh uh, the studies which have shown that like you know if there is heavy metal con contamination and you are exposed to smaller doses of heavy metals for longer duration of time there is risk of of uh, of like you know non carcinogenic diseases and if you take an example of lead it's a carcinogen so 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 definitely there are health benefits of eating food which is not contaminated and that is the reason like you know the, the heavy metals are regulated in water and in food as well thank you um, next question over here hi uh, Emily Fleece University of Tasmania um, thank you guys for those interesting, informative, and powerful presentations. My question is actually for Laura. Um, you mentioned blue space health benefits, um, and I'm interested in green space health benefits, and um, there's, a, there's a growing movement to investigate whether microbiomes and exposure to environmental microbiomes in green spaces contribute to the health benefits observed there. So I'm curious if, there, if you know anything about that with relation to blue space. Um, so clearly blue space, green space is a somewhat artificial distinction, right? There's obviously, uh, they overlap. And as you said, there is a lot of work starting to happen now around the microbiome. The only thing I would point out is the fact that part of the microbiome picture is also antimicrobial resistance. And um, it, 
is particularly evident in marine environments. So there may be obviously risks as well as benefits to the microbiome for interacting with marine or blue spaces. But it's, it's an area of, of great interest. I know that um, colleagues of mine at IS Global are, are looking into that. Mark, wave your hand. <laughs> so talk to him also. Good question, though. Thank you. Did anybody, the panelists, want to say anything about the microbiome and blue and green space? Cool. Next question. Thank you. Hi, thank you everybody for the presentations. I'm Durba, I'm from India. And uh, I had a question for Jessica. Um, you are talking about climate change and uh, fishery across a lot of areas, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how technology plays a role. I mean, I can give you an, what happens in India is that industrial trawling takes away a lot of fish and climate change comes in and sort of makes people more vulnerable because while trawlers can move into deeper waters, artisanal fishers, uh, fishermen and fisher folks can't. So I was wondering how that was incorporated into your study. And my second question is for uh, Mahababur. Um, there's a long-standing discussion about the problem of arsenic in the whole Indo-Gangetic belt and also in Bangladesh. So I was wondering that rainwater seems to ha offer a really viable alternative to groundwater which is contaminated with naturally occurring arsenic. And in that scenario, would it be useful to have to sort of consume rainwater and then sort of supplement the minerals which are not present in the rainwater through food, through, I don't know, some sort of supplements. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Okay, Jessica, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, thank you. So technology plays a really big role, both in capture fisheries and in aquaculture. I'll start with aquaculture for a moment because that's where things are changing a lot. There are many investments around the world in aquaculture that are going to change that landscape dramatically in terms of what species we're producing and how we're producing them, and even who may have access to that kind of technology. And so there are a lot of aid organizations looking at how they can support local communities through aquaculture production. On the capture fishery side, I think it's a really important point um, that you're making here about the difference between industrial and small-scale fisheries. Uh, there definitely are lots of technological innovations within small-scale fisheries, but what our model does is it does look at how climate change will shift species both in terms of latitude, so moving poleward, but also then moving into deeper, cooler waters. And when that occurs, then you, within the model, you have the fishers having to take on more costs to catch those fish. And that can reduce catch effort when there's less profitability um, with having to expend more resources to get to them. And so certainly if you're an industrial fisher and you have greater technology, to lower that cost of chasing those fish further from shore and in deeper waters, then you're going to have a disproportionate effect. And that's part of the big interest in looking and by sector some of these impacts. Uh, right now, most of that gets played out by the differences in which species those uh, different sectors are targeting. Um, so a lot of the small scale ones are, are looking at those onshore. So I think it's a really important point and one of the areas where there's both uncertainty entered but also a lot of opportunity. Thank you. Mapu, do you want to talk a little bit about arsenic? Thank you for this very important question. Rather than I answer this question, I will request my colleague who put his lot of effort to, with this study. So Solomon, those, I think he is around here uh, to say something. Thank you, Dr. Mahu. Hi, everyone. I'm Solaiman. So I'm also one of the co-investigators of this study. So to be honest, arsenic uh, is a big problem in Bangladesh. And like the area where we work, it, the salinity was more of a problem. So groundwater is predominantly brackish. So people can't access the groundwater, and they uh, typically drink the pond water. Or uh, in the monsoon, they rely heavily rely on rainwater. And our aim was to see whether, like those who are drinking that uh, rainwater, which is uh, low saline water, uh, versus those who are drinking groundwater. So we expected that maybe those who are drinking groundwater, they are consuming uh, high sodium, so probably they will have higher blood pressure. But to our surprise, it was that like the rainwater drinkers had higher blood pressure. It, it's not like mainly very groundbreaking, but it's like 
they had significantly higher blood pressure. So then we are trying to uh, figure out what is happening. Then we realized that probably like uh, groundwater has not only sodium but other minerals like uh, cardioprotective minerals known as the calcium, potassium, or magnesium. So these minerals probably playing a role here and they are kind of, uh, I mean, uh, counterbalancing the effect of sodium and they are actually uh, helping those who are drinking groundwater to regulate their blood pressure better than those who are drinking rainwater. So we are now planning a follow-up study to uh, measure the dietary intake of these minerals through like their food and also the water and compare that with uh, another area that is non-coastal where uh, salinity is not a problem. So then we, we will be able to understand better like whether uh, drinking rainwater is actually doing uh, that much harm. I hope that suffice. Thank you. Yeah, just to add with this like that, yeah, you are right that arsenic contaminated is like in most of the uh, part of the Bangladesh. So it's really difficult to have the safe water uh, but uh, uh, rainwater at the same time uh, we found the different findings so remineralization is an issue so how the government and the partners they are basically using this component as a priority because when we start remineralization we tell about the re remineralization but we didn't find any sustainability or continuation of this remineralization of rainwater so this is also a challenge thank you I'm going to ask for the next question over here, please. So uh, Amanda McKinney, I'm from the Institute for Human and Planetary Health, and I'm a physician and I focus on nutrition in terms of treating uh, disease. And there are some concerns with seafood um, in terms of bioaccumulation of toxins, um, but also, you know, cholesterol and some other issues as well. Um, so my question is, are you looking at uh, sea vegetables in terms of uh, providing the um, essential fatty acids uh, and the micronutrients rather than fish, uh, because that's obviously where the fish are getting it from in the first place. Jessica, you up for that? <laughs> Um, so in this study, no, we're not looking at those. There are certainly potentials for other kinds of innovations and in growth. A lot of the places where we're focusing, though, are, are in places where if they're not consuming seafood, they're eating very little animal protein, and there tend to be high rates of micronutrient deficiencies. And so one of the reasons for the emphasis on seafood in this case is that it can provide a lot of those essential nutrients. I think this issue, though, about potential contaminants and the role of that in health really just underscores how we can link across these different talks that we had here and the fact that some of the various pollutants within the environment can find their way back into human health. So the way we're damaging health of the environment comes back and can harm our own human health. And so I think that's a really important point. Um, the other thing is that I guess a lot of these cases, the seafood that's being consumed are, are pretty low on the trophic level. Um, so a lot of the bioaccumulation concerns are for those uh, higher trophic level species. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Maria, you want to add? Yes, we do. We, we really look into the bioaccumulation of toxics in fish and then see if the same happens in human. Um, as I said, in Indonesia, they are taking the lead in this and we are looking for scientists all over the world to um, work with them or work in a, in a core group. I think the, the um, release of toxics in plastic, in the environment and in bodies are, is, is a, a core. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Next question. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. So um, this is Vic Mohan from Blue Ventures Conservation. Firstly, I'm delighted to see a panel on blue planetary health at this meeting. It's really, really wonderful to see the acknowledgement of, of, of our blue planet. Um, what, what I want to do really is restate the challenge that Richard Norton articulated so powerfully this morning. Uh, nowhere is the tragedy of the commons more evident than in our oceans. And just to give you one example of that, it's our taxation that's subsidizing the global fishing fleet that's contributing to the unsustainable fishing that we're seeing around the world. And the people who stand to su suffer the most are the 300 million people living in the coastal tropics who rely on small-scale fishing for their livelihoods and for their food. 
these numbers of 300 million is likely to increase because coastal migration and because of unmet planning needs among coastal communities, and these communities are already among the most vulnerable on the planet because of climate change. So that's the challenge I want to set to the panel. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to add to that? Kind of hard to add to that. <laughs> I, can, I can answer uh, uh, from my point of view. Multinationals are, um, if we look at the plastic production, production right now and, and the fact that they say they want to beat the monster themselves by uh, having us collect it and um, um, start the trash hunting. Multinationals, right now we are producing over uh, almost 400 billion of kilos each year, and within 2025 it will be 500 billion or even more. Um, if, we, if, we, if we look at the, what, what this um, gentleman said this morning, I heard a little bit of it before I walked out because I needed to take some medicine against my flu. What, what we see is that multinationals take over the whole world and, and um, um, are uh, extremely uh, only making profit and doing nothing about health and the oceans and the world. Thanks, They're not Maria. helping, let me put it that way. Thank you, Maria. Manolis? Manolis Cuchivinas from ICE Global in Barcelona. Um, in, in, in much of the studies we're doing on, on toxicity of, of water and health, we, we are in, in our infancy, in, and we have been using very much a reductionist approach and going chemical by chemical. And in some occasions it's okay, you know, because you have a dominant chemical like the situation in Bangladesh where you have arsenic and, a few, and the, but in most other situations it's not okay. And we have not advanced very much in our methods of how to, to evaluate global toxicity of everything that we are talking. So I would like to ask, you know, Jessica or you, Laura, or uh, how would you see, you know, we should advance if we want to make some sort of more global assessment of toxicants in water? Um, I'm going to open this up to the panel. Does anybody want to comment on that? What is the direction we need to go to deal with the fact that it's complex mixtures in the environment, not single source uh, or single types of chemicals? Yeah, uh, this is really a very complex and uh, important question I see. In my opinion, like how we see uh, and how we prioritize the work, whatever we do, like uh, there are uh, contamination at different level, whether do we know the pathways of this contamination, how it is contaminated, how it is impacting the human health, whether we are exploring all those things. Even we are exploring, we know that these are impacting to the human health, whether the country level, the politician, they like it. Like I want to give an example like that, uh, like contaminated with arsenic, lead, many other things, not only in the food, but also in other way. So that like if I need to produce for a large population like a huge food production, even if it contaminated the politician, they want to ensure that food is secured. They don't want to talk about the contamination. So that like uh, to uh, like minimize these issues, it's really a challenging. So I am uh, like even not sure how we should move forward with these things. Maria? Activist. I sound like an activist, but probably I am one. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you talk about safety of food and you package it in all kinds of plastics that is leaking very serious toxics and additives into your food itself, if you put your food in the microwave, it's getting worse. So let's cut off and let's uh, stop with um, um, packaging that is already contaminating our food. I think that it's really close to us. It's not only in the ocean, it's just the whole industry that is uh, 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 um, poisoning our food and our, our, our whatever, my apple and my strawberry. Priya? Yeah. So um, I agree that it's very, very important to have a, a data or assess toxicity at global level, but it is equally important to assess toxicity or risk to contamination at local level because the kind of study we did, we, we end up making 
huge impact on policymakers. Um, uh, so we got the results from the study. We went to the regulator. We told them that this is the gap uh, in the in the in the way you are monitoring and the policy gap uh, that heavy metals are not being monitored and they are not being regulated. So after that, we have seen that there has been a policy change and we are invited, like I am invited to various committees. So, uh, so my only point is that yes, it is important to assess at global level, uh, uh, toxicity at global level, but equally important if you really want to see an impact to assess toxicity at local level as well. And then, last thing is that the, uh, the World Health Organization already in 2012 started acting against uh, uh, additives in plastics that, tox that are very toxic. And nobody listens in the world. So really, 2012, World Health Organization. So what, is, what are multinationals and governments doing? I wonder. I would just add um, to the response, Manos, that um, Mahmoud's study actually is a warning that we don't actually, aren't always able to predict how things are gonna go, that there are synergies if you don't look at mixtures that may come out that we, they can even be beneficial. And I would throw it also at um, Phil Landrigan and his group. <laughs> Next question. Hi, it's Veronica from Lima, Peru. And I'd like to thank the presentations. And I think it's a really good opportunity to take action, this, this, uh, this topic. Because, for example, uh, you started, Laura, you started with a question, which is the place you, you prefer to be. And I'm, at, I'm, I'm teaching students, undergraduate students at university, and they are between 20 and 22. And I asked the same question the first day, and they also answer the beach. But I think it's because we live close to the beach, hmm. yeah? And it was in a course where I asked, what do you want to do for the beach? And they, say, they first uh, pointed where were the problems that they see. And they saw that they were garbage, especially plastic, not only at the sea, but also in the arena, in the shoreline. Uh -huh. So I was really impressed that Two weeks after that, they showed me photos that they were doing voluntary work. And they were going to the, from morning, Saturdays and Sundays, collecting garbage. And they were like, uh, waiting them and also classifying. And, okay, there is not only this group, there are other groups in Lima, but I think this is great opportunity to, to take actions in university, maybe in some hours, of every course you have to show this, because this is a really problem. And as you see, almost all, all of us want to be in the beach at this moment, or maybe <laughs> when we are in a, when we, I, not in this moment, but when we are in a, when, when we want to go on vacations, no? So I think this is a really important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I loved you sharing your pedagogic practice. For full disclosure, people who grow up in mountains have a similar effect from looking at mountains. Yes, Maria, please. I, I thank you very much for saying that because we need data about what we find where and who are the producers of that. So the, the more people are photographing and sending in their pictures to by now the most important uh, app on that, on, in that case is the Literati app. Um, if, we, if we can document what we find, where we find it and how we find it, and I know NASA is making pictures from out of uh, satellites to see how many plastics are uh, floating within the 10 miles coastline, getting f back and forth and back and forth because mm -hmm. the isles are surrounded, most isles are surrounded by plastic. Um, uh, yeah, well, I don't know, plastics on the surface and in the, in the deeper levels. Um, the more we know, the better it is to fight people, to fight multinationals and tell them, see what happens with your Coca-Cola bottle. It's not only um, very nice to sell it, but also in the end of life, it's um, hurting our planet and our health. Thank you. Last question before lunch. Hey, uh, my name is Eileen. Oh, two more questions, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. My name is Eileen Murphy from ICN Business School in France. And uh, I'm working on a project uh, which involves uh, supply chains and uh, textile apparel. 
I was very impressed to hear about the uh, success that Maria's organization has had in changing the behavior of multinational uh, organizations. And my question is, uh, do you think uh, that there is any chance there might be changes in design of clothing to reduce uh, plastics such being used in fleece and uh, etc in the clothing apart from the uh, changes uh, more preventative uh, changes that are occurring further down the chain such as the filter that you discussed the filter is really hand of pipe and uh, thank you very much for asking this um, the uh, uh, we, we did we did do a little nasty thing. We uh, tested two big sport brands and two fast fashion brands, and we presented last week the results in the whole of the lion. So they were very quiet and very uh, impressed because the results are comparable with Thompson in 2016. If you if you compare that with what one well. Let me not go into details, but it's really very bad and very, very, very um, uh, dangerous. So we have a meeting on uh, Environmental Day in New York. It was very um, um, suddenly arranged. Um, and a lot of brands are coming, including manufacturers, and yarn makers, and um, even dry, dry cleaners are attending to see what they can do as a coalition of the willing. So uh, I can announce that next week there will be more news on behalf of the fashion brands because they are quite shocked what we did find now. And we keep on ranking the brands because that's what we are doing. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like Greenpeace, but now and then you need to bite instead of asking them to do so because they don't act voluntarily. So we pushed them a little bit. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, Anja Lutz from Healthcare Without Time Europe. I've been working in Brussels for 20 years and I just wanted to quickly give you an overview. So the European chemical uh, legislation reach covers only 30,000 chemicals and 100,000 are on the European market. And so what we're experiencing in the ocean pollution is the failure of the system, the failure to legislate and the failure actually to use the science and to apply it. And so maybe my plea is uh, we know about the impact of endocrine disrupting chemicals. There were scientists working on chemical by chemical for many years. We have a challenge of how do we evaluate the cocktail effect and we're just talking about here now the industrial uh, chemicals. We have biocides, we have pesticides and uh, pharmaceuticals. And so we have many different aspects, but it's the way our legislation is set up. We don't do horizontal. So anything that I've discussed already 15 years ago, but ago DHP, a softener in, in many products, I'm gonna have the same discussion because the industry, the legislation is not covering DHP in medical devices. So we're starting the whole debate again. Mm -hmm. And so what I think would be really important for the science community, looking at cocktail effects, then also measuring, and we have a lot of uh, um, places where we also don't have water treatment plants. If you go along the Danube River, you'll see the pollution. There's the data is all available and been tracked for many years. And so there is the more data, we need uh, testing of blood because we all pollute it and we need um, counseling that people know how to deal with it and we need to come up with solutions because ever for my work with people asking me, so what is safe to use? And we, there is no control group. We are doing a worldwide experiment without a control group. So that's why it's, uh, we really need to speed up and thinking and finding solutions and going um, you know, organic has always been repeated, it's very good, reducing the use of pesticides. And the consumer associations even don't recommend that women, if they want to become pregnant, that they eat fish. So, you know, going lower the food chain and going vegetarian or vegan would be the better option. And I think we would need far more in, uh, nutritional information and nutritionists who are looking at, uh, you know, vegan, and because that's also 
then we don't even need fish. Anyway, that was my comments. But there's so many things we could continuously work together. Thanks. So a manifesto for the rest of us. Thank you very much to our panel. I really appreciate it. Terrific job. And thank you to you.